The death of Sir David Amos, a respected MP killed in his own constituency, has left a family in grief and the political establishment reeling. Tonight, how can the country respond to this attack on our democracy? This is The Great Debate. This week on The Great Debate, in the shadow of tragedy, can our politicians be made safer? How should we treat our leaders? And has political debate turned toxic? Our viewers panel, drawn from around the country and beyond, will share their views. They'll have their say, and they'll put their questions to our studio guests. And we're joined this week by the Conservative MP and Chair of the Influential Backbench 1922 Committee, Sir Graham Brady. The former MP, Luciana Berger, who left Parliament after several people were convicted of threatening her online. Philip Grindel, who set up the parliamentary liaison and investigation team within the Metropolitan Police following the murder of Joe Cox. And journalist Jane Martinson, who was head of media for The Guardian. The big question facing them all tonight, has politics become too hostile? It's been one of the darkest weekends politics have had. I wouldn't want a situation where people are having to go through getting scanned or searched before they come and talk to me. We're not going to be much good for our constituents if we're not confident going into those meetings, if we're all looking over our shoulder with trepidation. We have to try and strike a balance here. Obviously, you know, MPs don't want to be surrounded by a ring of steel when they're out and about meeting the public. Heartbreakingly, we've been here before. That, again, was a moment of reflection, but also quite an intensive period for members of parliament. Every time we spit venom in each other's face, whether it's in an interview or on social media, we contribute to that and we make it worse. What the family quite rightly says, we need nicer politics. Tonight, parliamentarians mourned the loss of one of their own. We do not yet know the cause of his death and the legal process prevents us from discussing his alleged killer. But as many up and down the country are doing, we can ask whether our democracy is being diminished by the rancor, the finger pointing and now the violence faced by our elected representatives. And if so, what we can do about it. So let's go to the wall, to our viewers panel, and I'm going to start by talking to Chrysilda Basu from Autonom. Chrysilda, what are your thoughts on this? What can be done to ensure the attack on Sir David Amos is the last attack on an MP? Chrysilda, it's a very profound question. Do you feel optimistic? Do you think we can do something about this? Or are you asking that question more in despair than in hope? I think in despair, really, but hopefully um, something can be done. Do you worry that the, the fact that we are now in this situation, that we have to have this conversation at all, uh, is endangering, you know, your position as a citizen, your ability to contribute to the democracy, your ability, for example, to talk to your Member of Parliament, who, as it happens, is in our studio tonight. Yes, yes. OK. Chrysilda, thank you very much indeed. Let me come into our studio panel. The question there from Chrysilda Basu. What can be done to ensure the attack on Sir David Amos is the last on a Member of Parliament? Graham Brady. Well, first what? of all, I'm delighted you got the first question from a constituent of mine, so uh, welcome to Chrysilda. I think the question that she asks, there's only one straight answer, it's never going to be possible to make sure there is never another attack on a Member of Parliament. What we need to do is try to find ways in which we can reduce the risk 
but without losing something which I think is a very special thing, which is the fact that our politics, that our parliament, our members of parliament, are probably the most accessible in the world in any major democracy. And that's something that often visitors from overseas come and talk to us and they're astonished by the ease of connection between constituents and members of parliament. I think that's really precious and we need to keep it, but we need to get the balance right. You made this point in, in your speech in the debate tonight uh, about our parliament being so open and accessible. What would you, as a long-time uh, member of parliament, feel that you've got to change or that you've got to have to allow that openness and accessibility to continue? It's a very difficult question because we've focused, obviously, a lot on constituency surgeries given the tragic circumstances last Friday. But most of us spend quite a lot of time in our constituencies. We might be seen in the supermarket. We've got to go from our homes to our, our cars to walk through town. Uh, there are so many points where members of parliament will be vulnerable if somebody seriously intends to do us harm. Mm -hmm. uh, but it has to be the case that in constituency surgeries, uh, we can have some basic measures in place. Uh, talking before the show uh, with uh, Philip, for instance, we were uh, looking at the fact that um, uh, people being asked to leave their bags outside the room might offer a, a small degree of okay. security. Uh, so things which don't get in the way of that direct personal contact, uh, we should be prepared to consider. Luciana Berger, your time as a Member of Parliament was to some extent characterised by threats to your safety. Uh, did you ever feel safe as a Member of Parliament? Um, I felt safe when we were in the Houses of Parliament because people do have to be checked to go into that building. So there are certainly some places where you know, people will go through the barriers, but you do have to reconcile. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really difficult task to make sure that you know, we have a country where people do have a constituency link, they do have MPs that they know and that they can name, that they can go to, other than in other countries where I think the democracies are poorer, where people just have a list and they've got no one who's their direct contact. And we have to find a way to reconcile, ensuring that, that people can have that personal connection while minimising the risk and doing it as safely as possible. And my, my, my concern for that is about the, the, the quality of our politics, because I don't want to put anyone off considering putting themselves for, forward for public office. We have to minimise the risk in order that the next generation or people of all ages um, want to be elected members, want to be representatives, that we don't diminish the pool because otherwise our politics and our country will be poorer because of it. I, without going into the specifics of your time, was there a moment where you thought to yourself, I just can't do this anymore, given the, the circumstances in which I have to work? There's certainly some, some dark moments and, I mean, you pointed at the front to the fact that during my time in Parliament I saw six people convicted of the threats and the racism that they directed towards me and countless others that either were untraceable or didn't quite meet the criminal threshold, but, you know, I received thousands and thousands of messages and I'm, I'm not going to, like, diminish that because people can receive just one message and it can have a, a massive detrimental impact on their lives and it doesn't have to be just an MP. Certainly, I, I stood in court and heard the victim impact statements of people from all other fields that might have been mm. um, at the hands or uh, had that abuse directed at them, and it can have untold effects and massive consequences on people's lives. So mm. I'm not going to in any way diminish that. And um, I, I remain of the view that being a Member of Parliament is an incredible privilege and honour and responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and for all the challenges that came with it, um, I'd okay. do it all again, and it was... It was um, well, I think there's a, a lot of people in the audience who appreciate that point that you make. And I want to come back to the issue of social media, but let's think not just of our own parliamentarians, but there's experience that we can draw on, I think, from abroad. And I'm going to come back to our wall, to our viewers' panel, and talk to Michael Mo, who was an elected representative in Hong Kong. Michael, good to see you again. You were with us uh, last week. Uh, how do you re respond to what you're hearing and what you've seen in the last few days? Um, to me, it's like the unfortunate event uh, of Joe Cox. Uh, it's happened like quite a couple of years ago. And we see that politicians around the world have been harassed or even receiving threats, death threats or physical threats all over the place. And it's, it's quite common. 
and it struck me as like uh, there are like years for the UK or for the Parliament to prepare for something like uh, measures or resources that could protect uh, a politician, the MPs, uh, to do their field work or do their GP, uh, to do their surgeries safe. For instance, like uh, in Hong Kong, we uh, protect ourselves uh, by having body cameras, uh, even doing our constituency surgeries, or we request citizens' advice to have a screened rooms if we really feel unsafe, because like politics in Hong Kong is so divided, and it's just, uh, to me, it's just as divided as uh, the UK. So okay. why on earth, like for so long years, we have Sir David Ammon's unfortunate uh, okay. incident happen? Thank okay, Michael, just stay there for a second. Philip Grindel, you had the responsibility of trying to work out what to do to protect people uh, who were elected representatives. Are the sorts of measures that Michael's talking about ones that you think we could see in this country? No, I don't think so, because I don't think that many of those measures are measures that MPs want to have. And our challenge at the time, and I guess the police's challenge now, is to understand what the problem is, but fix it around what the MPs want. Because if we don't... You know, we can't just change how we do things but from a security perspective, because ultimately the MPs are the ones that direct it, they, how they want to conduct their surgeries. And every one of them does it differently. That's, that's the real challenge, because their, their constituents are very different. So, you know, uh, so David has his in, in a particular location where he's always had it. Somebody else who may have a very rural constituency may meet their constituents in different venues across that constituency, where it's just simply not practicable to have the same security measures as someone who has a permanent residence in, in the city. So our task is to work out how do we make the individual safe in their constituency. And so very often what we would do is we'd go and do actually one-to-one -one meetings and say, let's look at how you're operating and look at how we can, as, as uh, uh, Luciana said, how, how can we reduce that threat? Indeed, and the Home Secretary has told us that every MP is now being talked to by their local police force. Jane Martinson... Um... As a journalist, how worried do you feel about the idea that the security for elected representatives is interfering with the freedom of our uh, democratic process? I think everybody who cares about democracy should care on lots of levels, which have already been touched on. You know, the idea, as Luciana said, that this, of course, is going to put off anybody from applying to do a job which is one of the most important jobs we have, our elected representatives, and how to ensure that access can be maintained with constituents, with members of the media, who should be able to hold the powerful to account. With that comes the, the idea that you have to have free exchange of information. Mm. Um, I, was, I was struck listening um, to the, the, the uh, wall of panellists that... You know, it's been five years since Joe Cox's appalling murder, and in that time, threats against MPs have actually increased. And that's, to me, really, really terrifying and sad that I would hope that in five years' time, whatever we decide as a country needs okay. to be done, something is actually done to make this better. A lot of reaction, I think, on our wall for, on the point that what's happened or not happened in the last five years. But I, I want to come to Liz Lowry, who... Um, Viewers will have met before. Um, Liz, what is uh, your view on, on all this? Uh, good evening, Trevor. My view is that the ability of elected representatives to meet with their constituents is paramount to a functioning democracy. The safety of MPs and their staff like all workers dealing with dissatisfied people, must be reassessed. I was a housing officer for a number of years with my local council, and I did loan visits on a weekly basis. Every visit was a challenge because I was actually going into houses and I never knew who would be present in any particular property. So basic safety measures included checking out who you were visiting, always being near the exit of the building and also learning to read the mood and the demeanour of the person. 
And my final point is that MPs, like us all, are human beings with lives and families, and they are elected to do a job, and they should not have to suffer abuse online or in life while carrying out their duties. Okay. In a democracy, it's the ballot box, okay. not abuse and attack that okay. should be the vehicle of change. Liz, thank you very much. Graham Brady. Um... Liz Lowry's point, of course, is that it's not just MPs, but also their staff. And indeed, I think there was some applause from, uh, I think, on Luciana's point earlier on, that there are lots of other people who are not members of Parliament who face this kind of abuse. Absolutely right, and a critically important point to make. I, I think two other things that uh, occur to me. One, of course, uh, it's one thing making a member of parliament safe at a constituency surgery. You've got to think of others who may be there, whether it's other members of the public, whether it's... Uh, I always have a local councillor with me in my uh, advice surgeries. I usually have a volunteer who's doing reception uh, for me. We have to think about the safety of those people. And I think the other thing, coming to Luciana's point about whether people are going to be deterred from putting themselves forward for mm -hmm. public office, uh, we've got to think it's not just us uh, making our own decision and making our own calculation of risk. It's our families as well. And I think that's in some ways a, a much bigger danger that people will, will tell their loved ones just don't consider it. Well, let's go. We're going to come back to that question a little bit later, but let's go a little bit wider, because we've been talking about how to keep members of Parliament safe. But is the bitter tone of political debate part of the problem? That's next. Are you a liar, Prime Minister? Uh, the right honourable gentleman's words would be less hypocritical and absurd. You cannot get any worse than a bunch of scum. As you see, the panto season has just come early. Uh, so, so let me tell Welcome back to The Great Debate, where we're asking, has politics become too hostile? I want to move on from the tragic events of David Amos's death last week and instead talk about some of the lessons that we can take from his life. And I want to come to Stephanie Merritt in Buckinghamshire. Stephanie, I think you've got a question for the studio. How can we encourage more respect and civility in politics? Thank you. Simple, straightforward. Stay there, Stephanie. I'm going to come back to you. Stephanie's question is, how can we encourage more respect and civility in politics? Luciana, what would be your top tip? I think, I think everyone, it's incumbent on everyone at every level to lead by example. And whether that's in person or online, both should be treated equally and we have to treat each other with respect. We might have differing views, different opinions, different ideas about where our country should go and what things should happen, but let's engage in that debate in a civil way, in a kind way. You know, it was, it was only just over five years ago that Jo Cox saw her life taken and we talked about having more in common and to, to engage in that debate in a civil way. And as you've rightly pointed out, things haven't got any better. In some cases, they've got worse. I think... You know, Again, we're having this conversation, and I just really, really hope in, in the wake of these tragic, horrific events that, as a country, we can come together and actually really think, all of us, you know, what well, can we do? Well you, well, you know what I've got to ask you, then, is um, after Joe Cox's death, everybody said the same thing. We had this same conversation. Kind of gentler politics. Six weeks. And we were still in the place, and I don't need to get into who calls who what names, but... Graham Brady, is this just part of politics now? It's not just knockabout now, is it? There's venom in it. Well, there clearly is in some instances. You know, I've got to say, having come today from the tributes in the House of Commons to David Amos, having come from the church service, which is a full church, uh, and most members of the House of Commons, I think, present for it, it's actually been quite a, an uplifting experience to see the tributes to a very good uh, constituency member of parliament coming from across the house. And I, you know, I think that really gives a lot of hope. And one of the things that kept cropping up uh, was David's civility, his decency, 
his warmth and, and humour, being praised from people sometimes saying that they're shocked to find how much they liked him. Um, I, I think I agree entirely with Luciana. It's got to be about example. It's got to be about all of us treating others with respect. But we've all said and, that before. And sort of, I've, we've heard and, this before, Graham. And, 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 you know, David Amos managed to do it for a career of 38 years. I hope I've managed for my 24 years. Uh, I, it is possible to do it, and I don't okay. think there's any reason why we can't all do it. All right. Stephanie, what is your view? Do you think that politics, by which we mean the political class, the elected people, the people we see on the telly and so on, can they change? Um, I think respect um, when it comes to politics, I think it's a much deeper issue than social niceties. Um, I think certain politicians make people angry and um, they also actively encourage division. Um, and, and I think there has to be an onus on politicians to to take responsibility for their actions and the effects of their actions. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Stephanie, there's quite a lot of support for what you're saying. And I, I was just going to ask you, when you say lots of politicians, um, would you like to share an example? What's in your mind? What kind of thing? Um, a lot of people in the cabinet, unfortunately. Um, their language is divisive. They... Uh, okay. The UK seems to have been at war with itself since 2016. And okay. this is encouraged okay. by a very compliant media. We're encouraged to blame doctors, lawyers, judges, okay. um, diversion tactics. And it's, it, it's become really unpleasant. OK, Stephanie, thank you so much, and um, I appreciate your expanding there. But there's a lot of support for what Stephanie seems to be saying in the viewers' panel on our wall. Can I see those who think that it is possible that we can bring civility and respect to our politics? Those who think that we can do this, hands up. OK, and those who think that actually something basic is broken, that, that it's, very it's going to be very difficult to do that. Can I see those hands? It's rather more, rather more. Graham Brady, our wall's pretty pessimistic. Yeah, um, and... Reassure them. Tell them how, how you guys think you can do it. You can make the thing change. Well, I, I, as I said, and, and as Luciana said, I, I think the importance of doing it by example is uh, crucial. I, I was struck, though, the um, shots that you had of the chamber and some exchanges at Prime Minister's questions. It is always quite interesting. People say that they hate that knockabout in the chamber. But Actually, it's, they watch. it's the main thing that people watch. <clears throat> yeah, and they could go and watch on the Parliament channel any number of serious, respectful exchanges in the House okay. of Commons. People, by and large, have no interest in doing it. There are, I think there are more people who do watch now than must be the case. All right. Positive. Let me come back to the wall. I want to talk to somebody who is, like me, he's kind of politics nerd, I think. Josh Morrison. Josh, Hello. what do you make of this? Where do you think all of this is coming from? Well, uh, I think one of the things that I always mention is role models and the idea of uh, setting by example. Um, I think university is a place where a lot of this conversation starts. It's really the, the point where you know, young adults start to express themselves. And when it comes to certain views, if you express certain views, you can easily be labelled as a hardcore left or as a Tory and I think the, the language is quite divisive and it's quite obtrusive as well. Um, I know that we've mentioned, you know, someone mentioned previously that we've been at war with ourselves since 2016. I think one of the best ways to be defeated is to defeat ourselves. And I think that's one of the things that we're doing at the moment is we've created such a wall and such a barrier. Um, you know, and, and I, I don't think, you know, as, as John Lennon was kind of laughed at when he did the whole give peace a chance campaign, 
I'd like to say it a little bit stronger that I don't think we are giving peace a chance within ourselves, within just us as a country. Um, you know, I think we're in a really volatile position right now. We're in a very vulnerable state. And I think that to show the next generation, uh, it doesn't give us a lot of hope. It gives us hope that we actually don't want politics at all. We don't want people sat in a, in a, in a room with nice green leather uh, couches to be speaking on our behalf. Actually, the conversations are happening on right. the level ground. Maybe that's where the conversations should be happening more, like this. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you, Josh. It's, it's so nice to see a young person bringing somebody of my generation, John Lennon, into the conversation. But, Jane, Josh's point, which is really about... Essentially, we categorise people, put them in a box and turn them into the enemy. How much of... Um, that is the responsibility of people like you and me, journalists, the media. Um, I think it's partly, of course, the responsibility of the media. I also think... I mean, I was struck as well by looking at those scenes. We have, through history, um, through tradition, an unbelievably adversarial parliamentary system. And our media has grown up holding these people to account by making sure that we cover it as two people fighting against each other, sneering, shouting, jeering. And it, it, the idea, I was struck by what Stephanie said, that basically it shouldn't be like this, and she got lots of support, because that's seen as populist. That's seen as a really good thing. It's populist. We want that to happen. But then there was a point in our history when so was bear baiting, and we got rid of that. There has to come a point where... We do have a civilised debate because these things matter. Now, of course, we're not all going to agree with each other about politics. Even if we change our system to have more of a, you know, against the first past the post. I'm not, I'm not okay. saying that's the answer. But what we do need is to really think about what matters and actually giving people entertainment, being rude, shouting, boosterish behaviour. That's madness and it brings this country into disrepute. Luciana, briefly. I mean, <laughs> oh, sorry. I've got to come back to you after the break. I beg your pardon. Um, next, if a toxic culture online is part of the problem, is it time to crack down on social media? For social media companies, it means taking seriously the responsibility not to allow anonymous people to undermine our democracy. Some newspapers have run slogans about traitors and enemies of the people, and I think that that has poisoned the world of British politics. Surely there has to be repercussions for people engaging in what would be criminal behaviour if it happened in person. Has politics become too hostile? That's the topic of the great debate this week. And one thing that could be on the way are tighter controls on social media. Let's start by hearing from Patrice Wesley Coles on this. Patrice. Good evening. Thank you, Trevor. Should social media companies be forced to tackle online hate? Um, Patrice, tell, tell us a little bit about why you asked that question. What, what's um, your background and why, why are you interested in this point? Well, I, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I was um, a human rights judge. I did immigration and asylum work. And I've been very concerned about the growth of hateful messages on social media uh, channels. And I've written to my MP, who's been um, written to me and has said that she is going to ensure that the online safety bill is strengthened uh, in Parliament. It's going through Parliament at the moment. But my view is that um, social media companies, Twitter, Instagram and Facebook, have a duty and responsibility to tone down toxicity. They can do this. They, they can block access to their domains and URLs. And they can also publicise those who post hate-filled messages anonymously, and they should be prosecuted. OK. Also, yes, sorry. Thank you, Patrice. A lot of support for, for you there. Slightly ironic that we're on media here, but a lot of support for what you're saying. Now, Patrice's question is, should social media companies be forced to tackle online hate? Before I come back to the studio, I want to talk to somebody who 
has thought a lot about this and experienced a great deal. We're going now to the United States. Um, and we're going to talk to uh, the chief executive of the Center for Countering Digital Hate, Imran Ahmed. Good evening, uh, Imran, or good afternoon to you. What is your view about the issue of how we control uh, social, social media or expressions of hatred on social media? Well, I thank you. And look, the, the question is quite telling. Should social media companies be forced to tackle online hate? And that's because they've failed to do so without any, without any coercion. The reason being that they have found it easier, less obstructive to, the, to, the, to their core business, which is making oodles of money through advertising, to not curate the environments that they administer. And despite the fact that their rules clearly state, when you sign up to social media, you are of course going onto a private platform that has terms and conditions, those endless lists of things that you can and cannot say on those platforms uh, for fear of breaking their, their rules. Those standards are both a responsibility to the user, that those are the things we have to abide by, those things that most of us abide by, but they can also be seen as a reciprocal right, that we have the right, therefore, to expect an environment that is free of hate, misinformation, of lies, of violence and intimidation. And they have failed to do so. Not only do we know that through observation, so when we report misinformation, okay. report hatred to them, we find that they don't take action. But the whistleblower who uh, has been putting, uh, has been re releasing papers, the Wall Street Journal in particular has been covering it in si and 60 Minutes in the US, they showed that only that Facebook know themselves that only three to five percent of hate on their platform is dealt with. Even worse, when it comes to what we've just experienced in the United Kingdom, 0.6 percent, less than one in a hundred of violence and intimidation is dealt with by their platform. And they think that's job well done. It's extraordinary, really, isn't it, that we're being forced to force them. Imran, those are important figures, but I guess that. Um... The social media companies might say, OK, you can throw those percentages, but really, how big a problem is this? How many people does it really affect? Well, I mean, here's the thing, that the violence, intimidation, the hatred, these are their own internal statistics. We actually found those to be true ourselves. They, they pushed back. I mean, we, we actually put out research showing that 5% of hate was dealt with. They came back and said, that's nonsense. We've got our own figures. They don't corroborate that at all. It turns out their own figures said that it was exactly right. So we, we, we can be pretty certain that around 19 and 20 bits of hate on their platform have no action, around 99 and 100 bits of violence and intimidation. And they will say, of course, it's very difficult for us to deal with because there's such a volume of it. Well, isn't that the problem? That they've allowed for the creation of a sense okay. that this is normal. And when you, when you allow the unfettered flow of violence, hate and intimidation on a platform that is central to how we communicate these days, okay. how we set social mores and values, then it changes it mal-socialises society as a whole. What has changed in the past few years? Social media. Thank you very much, uh, Imran Ahmed. Um, the, the, the social media companies, of course, would contest all of this, and they would say, you know, their platforms, they do their business. Um, Luciana Berger, what did you make of that? I think Imran makes some very, very important points. And I would attest that what happens online shouldn't be treated any differently to what happens face to face with someone. We wouldn't we wouldn't countenance what we hear and see online in person. So why should it be OK online? We've been having these debates now. I mean, I recall having them 2013, 14. It's still going on. And I would agree with the question. You know, it is the online safety harms bill that's coming through Parliament. I pray that the government is going to do even more than it's already doing to tighten up what we have at the moment. Because I would say that one message is one too many in terms of the detrimental impact it could have on people. It's not OK and we shouldn't countenance it and we should do everything possible to stop it. And so far, I think that the uh, social media companies have fallen far short of their responsibility to take this stuff seriously. So it, I, I think we're at the point now where it has to be a stick rather than a carrot. Philip Grindel, was this a topic that came up in your work in thinking about how to protect parliamentarians? Yeah, I mean, it was everyday business. But an interesting statistic for you, though, is that if during the most toxic period that we were there, the four years of the Brexit debate, we analysed all the reported abuse and threats that MPs received or reported to us, and actually less than 15% was by social media. 
The vast majority was by letters, phone calls, emails. And I know Luciana worked, worked together and she had some horrendous letters delivered to her. But interestingly, one of the challenges that, that actually happens is the legislation. So, you know, we're five years on from Joe Cox. We could have very easily changed some of the legislation that allows the police to tackle this a lot easier. So the most common offence is malicious communication. The threshold for that is a term in law called grossly offensive. And very often, it, within policing and within the judicial system, that threshold isn't met. So actually, if we really want to take it seriously, so I'd push it back to the politicians and say, you know, you're the people that create the laws, you need to change the laws so that we can actually tackle these people better. All right, I'm going to come back to you, but let me come back, let's come to the wall and let's see what guidance do the politicians get from our 100 viewers. Do you... I want to ask you if you think that we could, through legislation, as it were, tame the social media at the moment? Or could... Or would, how many people think that it is possible to use the law to uh, stop some of the things that are going on on social media? Those who think that, it's, that the law is part of the answer, let show. Yeah, 50% of you think that that is... that the law could be deployed here. Um, I'm, ge I'm guessing that quite a lot of the rest of you think that actually this isn't about the law, it's about people's attitude. Jane Martinson, um, what do you think? Do you think it is possible, A, to tame social media, and B, do you think the law is the, the, the way through here? I do think it's possible to tame social media. I think we have to. I think with great power comes responsibility, and... I truly believe that there should be more responsibility taken uh, by the giant social media companies to what's happening on their platforms. Um, what's interesting how, is how we do this, and it's the online harms bill has been winding its way through Parliament for two years without... I know we've had a pandemic, but there's no details, there's no real enthusiasm to actually get some responsibility written into law. The EU is doing a separate thing with their Digital Services Act. We need to act and make sure that the kind of abuse that really can be changed, actually, it's really clever that the, um, these huge companies with huge amounts of money and very little in the way of taxation um, actually employ very powerful lobbyists to make sure that we all think it's too complicated to make them take responsibility. But actually, it's not that complicated. It can be done. Thank you. OK, well... Let's take a break. In a moment, is the political climate stopping the best people from standing for office? It's really important that we get good people in public life, but this is the risk that we're all taking. My partner came home and said, I don't want you to do it anymore. I don't... Because the next time that phone goes, it could be a different conversation. Welcome back. Has politics become too hostile? And is it turning people away from politics? Let's start by hearing from the wall Chris Key. Chris, you've got a question. Hello, panel. Hi, panel. Um, how can we encourage more people to go into politics today when the current environment really is so toxic? Well, that's pretty straightforward. Chris asked... How can we encourage more people into politics when the current environment is so toxic? Luciana. And there's certainly lots of different ways in which we can uh, reach out and connect with particularly young people to learn about politics and get involved, and whether that's youth parliaments, and um, whether that's model United Nations uh, politics courses. Um, certainly at this moment, we've seen a lot of um, promotion online of um, the main political parties having future candidates programmes. Um, so there are certainly mechanisms and means and mentoring as well, which can encourage people and, and teach them and give them opportunity to learn the ropes and see how it's all done. OK. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to want to. So. All right, well, I'm going to back to... Chris, um, just to be clear, have you ever been tempted to get into the politics trade yourself? Yeah, so for about four or five years ago, I was thinking about it. I got myself to prove from, for one of the parties to stand. But I think over the last few years, I've been put off by the particularly the nastiness over the Brexit referendum, the abuse that people have been put up with. And I've, and I've seen your speech, and Lucian, I'm not Jewish myself, but the disgusting abuse that you see, you saw personally. I, I mean, I was close to tears when I watched your speech in the House of Commons. And I just feel that I wouldn't want to put my family through that. 
and I'm I'm probably less at risk of getting that abuse as a man and and and, and, and being Catholic. But I just find it disgusting that people have to put up with it. And I applaud you for for your stance. And I really hope you stand for Parliament again because I think you're a role model to, to my own daughters. Okay, we're not we're not going to do the <laughs> candidate selection here. But Graham no, no. Graham Brady. Persuade Chris that it's OK. <laughs> well, I, I think we've, we've all got to be a lot more positive about public life. And I think one of the really important messages we have to send is to say that it is a big privilege to serve in Parliament or indeed to be a local councillor. Elected office is a privilege. Uh, it's a very important thing. And people need to speak up for it and encourage. Having said that, uh, I'm also aware, we've got that in my party, we've got a very long list of people who are putting themselves forward uh, to stand for office. And I think maybe it's less of a problem getting people to put themselves forward in the first place, more of a problem getting people to stay. And you know, certainly I've seen over the last few years a number of very good colleagues in the House of Commons. Some of them were very effective ministers uh, who then okay. thought they'd reached a certain point and they left Parliament. And you'd have to talk to them as to why that was, but I think it's a serious loss. So it's a retention okay. problem. But um, I think Connor... I could see Connor um, wa waving or, or nodding enthusiastically. Connor, what, what's your point? Well, it hasn't put me off public life because I've seen the effect that MPs have had in creating things like the NHS and really helping people. And while our system's not perfect, it's a lot better than other systems around the world. And I want to be a part of it. Um, Connor, we spoke before. Remind me how old you are. 15. 16? 15. Fantastic. 15. 15. Wow. Jane Martinson, is that, the, that, is that what we want in Parliament now? That kind of... it's, it's, as a mother of teenagers, I'm, I applaud Connor because it's so fabulous to hear them really interested in politics and wanting to get involved. I think a huge number of younger people are actually really maybe not put off by some of the sort of venom and abuse that we're talking about because they, they have b been born into it, a world in which it's normal for abuse and harm and horrible things to happen online. But actually, it, you know, that's why politics is such a great thing, actually. I mean, I, we were laughing earlier that the two professions that come at the bottom of every poll of, you know, respect and trust are obviously politics and journalists. We couldn't remember who's the bottom, possibly journalists. Um, <laughs> but, but actually, they're, they're, they're great jobs. They're really important things. You know, you, you, you particularly, politicians have a great role and I think more people should be encouraged to, to join. Um, but we have to make it safe. Philip, you, you had to hang around the House of Parliament a lot. Would you advise a young relative of yours to give it a go? Well, interestingly, I've got a, a niece who uh, studied politics and she came into Parliament to work with one of the politicians in there that I had arranged and she's now going on and doing that. And that's her, that's her ambition. But interestingly, I, I've done some work um, for, with some of the conferences and some of the candidates and some of the councillors. And if you actually talk to some of those people, the treatment that they've had, that's what puts people off because the, the actual candidacy process and also some of the treatment the councillors get is horrendous. And so, you know, when we look at... And we had Law Views Review a couple of years ago about that, uh, and that's a really, really hostile environment around being a candidate and, 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 and going through that process. OK, well, it, um, that's a kind of hopeful moment. I'm, I'm thinking that I might come back to our viewers' panel to, to see where the mood has got to. Let me first say... Let me ask you... Uh, those of you who got young relatives, who would advise them it's still worth going into politics? Ha hands up. Yeah, OK. And about a half, who would, who would absolutely say stay clear? <laughs> OK, OK. Uh, yeah, it's not, not a lot, not, not, not so much, but OK. Um, just very briefly, Graham Brady, very quickly. They're advertising legal, law, uh, s law salaries at 150,000 for a young lawyer. Why do politics when you can get 150 grand? This, at has got, this has got to be a personal choice, but I think for those of us, many of us who uh, did take a pay cut to enter Parliament, uh, have nonetheless found it a hugely fulfilling uh, thing, a great privilege. I think those of us who are able to represent our own home constituencies especially, it's a wonderful thing. And, you know, I did talk about some who've chosen to leave. Okay. And lots of us choose to stay because we find it so fulfilling. All right. And I'm going to come to a final show of hands for our viewers' panel. Coming back to our, our original 
question. I'm going to ask you to ask, is politics just too hostile? Those who think that our politics has just become too hostile, hands up. And a clear majority. It feels like we are leaving tonight's conversation on a slightly pessimistic note that we have a very hostile political environment. That's all we have time for to this evening. It just remains for me to say thanks to our panellists here in the studio, Philip Grindel, Jane Mardinson, Luciana Berger and Graham Brady. Thanks, especially to our viewers. We'll see you next week. Keep debating, keep talking.